Thanks for joining the M4 Internal Medicine EPA curriculum. In reality, we would have been doing this together, but given the circumstances, I thought I would record a little video talking you through something that I find is very important and that I hope will be an important part of your practice in the future. And this is self-reflection. The work I'm presenting to you now is work that I have um, performed in the past with Drs. Matea and Dr. Caputo Siedler, with whom you may have worked in the past. So I want to give them a shout out. What I really want, hope that we'll discuss today is the, really the use of self-reflection as a tool for fostering lifelong learning. And I'm going to be giving you a self-reflection exercise that I'm hoping will help you assess your own strengths, your own limitations, um, and think about how you might turn this into uh, a practice for yourself in the future, and perhaps a practice that you might incorporate into your teaching practice in the future as well. As interns in July, you will be required to spend quite a bit of time with third-year students and fourth-year students, um, such as yourself currently, um, and you'll be guiding their learning experiences. And I really believe this self-reflective practice is something that helps us all grow in the long run. So while you sit there listening to me, take a second to think about what self-reflection really means to you. To me, self-reflection is a practice that I've developed over the years. It started with um, something that my teachers in the past had asked me to do, which was to think about a clinical scenario where I was taking care of a patient, think about what my deficit in the knowledge was for managing that patient's clinical condition, uh, come up with a clinical question, look up what the response to that clinical question was, and formulate what my management plan may be based on my research. So to me, that was a little bit of reflection in thinking about where my own deficits were. After that, in working with my mentors and my coaches, what I came to understand was the ones that I valued the most helped me think about where my own deficits were, helped me to come up with my own plan for my own growth, um, and then helped me reflect upon what I'd achieved over time. And really when you think about what the ACGME expects, us of a, expects of us as practicing clinicians, it's the six core competencies that we are required to do. Um, and these are, as you know, patient care, which is the day-to-day -day management of our patients, professionalism, which you're all very familiar with, showing up on time, being present, interpersonal and communication skills, so working alongside our colleagues in other parts of healthcare, Medical knowledge, that's the test taking piece, but also the application of that medical knowledge, of course. Systems based practice, so understanding the system in which we exist, the village in which we practice, as it were. And then practice based learning and improvement. And that, I think, is really the key to all of this. Practice based learning and improvement may be something that you haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, but it's really what you do day to day. When you admit a patient and then you go up to go on to up to date to read a little bit about whatever that diagnosis may be, that's you working on the practice-based learning and improvement part. Now, what you have noticed is that since we started the um, Milestones project, which may seem quite second nature to you, um, it, it's something that has helped us understand where our learners are, whether they're meeting their current expectations of performance, and if not, where are their gaps so that we can identify appropriate remediation strategies for them. And in particular, this is where PBLI comes in. Um, and this particular milestone for medicine looks at your monitoring of your own practice with a goal for improvement. So what you'll see here are the critical deficiencies, the aspirational, and then the in-betweens. When you're ready for unsupervised practice at the end of your res residency, you will be someone who regularly self-reflects on your own practice or performance, and you will consistently be acting upon those reflections to improve your practice. You will also be able to recognize suboptimal practice or performance as an opportunity for learning and self-improvement. And I know for many of you, you are already doing this on a regular basis, um, but this is really just to say it doesn't stop here. This monitoring of your practice with a goal for improvement is something that you will continue to do for the rest of your career. That is why we call it medical practice. 
And if you think about it, um, I find this quote from John Gardner, one of the premier educationalists in the history of the United States, um, a really important one. So they discuss the ultimate goal of the educational system is to shift to the individual the burden of pursuing his education. And what that really means is that as adult learners, it is up to us to understand where our weaknesses are and how we want to improve on those. The type of practice you're going to be doing during residency is something called experiential learning. And what that means is that you're going to be following a path of a circular path of having an experience, feeling something from that experience, reflecting and observing on what that experience was and why you felt that way, abstracting that into um, something that can be applied more broadly, and then actively experimenting on what that is so that you go back to that concrete experience with a new understanding. This graph here really represents Kolb's theory of experiential learning, and I'm going to try to express to you what that might mean as a more concrete example. So some years ago, I started learning to dance, flamenco more specifically, and it was a new dance for me. I'm not someone who's an, a, a great dancer, but I really, really loved it. But what I realized was when I started to learn to dance, there were some things I felt comfortable doing, but there were some things I felt very uncomfortable doing. And in particular, I felt really uncomfortable with turns. And so I had to spend a little bit of time thinking about why I was having difficulty with turns. When I thought about what was it that was difficult about those turns, I abstracted that to a prior time when I had felt the same way. I felt very unsteady and very uncomfortable. And it was a time when I had been skiing. My experiences of skiing are basically getting on two skis, going, and when I need to stop, falling into someone as a way to stop because I didn't know how to stop. And that was as I understood a problem of understanding where my center of gravity was. On skis, I totally lost that sensation. And I was feeling the same way when I was dancing and in particular when I was doing turns. So I thought, well, what can I do about this to make myself feel a little more comfortable um, and also learn where my center of gravity is so that I don't feel so distant when I'm trying to turn. So I recalled I had this skateboard sitting around in my garage. So I got my skateboard out. I started practicing um, having that center of gravity while on the skateboard and feeling more comfortable, feeling more comfortable with falling, of course, in a more controlled manner, but also feeling more comfortable with knowing where my center of gravity was. And after practicing on my skateboard, I honestly felt better in my dance class. I felt like I knew where I was. I felt more comfortable. I felt more comfortable falling. I felt more comfortable turning. And as a result, my dance performance improved significantly. So I want you to think about that and how that might relate to who you are and what your practice is going to be like. Now, in terms of self-reflection in medical education, it has been studied um, over and over again. Um, and the practice of the reflective practice and incorporating reflective practice regularly into our day-to-day um, -day work has been shown as an important way of improving communication skills, an important way of discerning between the two parts of what we do in medicine. One is the art of healing. The other is the science of cure. Now, the science of cure is more the medical knowledge. It's quantifiable. You do MCQs, you do board exams, and so you get a sense of where you might be for that. The art of healing, though, is something more deep, more meaningful, and different. And I know you have felt it. Um, and incorporating that reflective practice into your regular day-to-day -day helps you understand what part of your presence with the patient helped with the healing part. It has also been shown to improve levels of empathy in practitioners of all types of healthcare professions. It has also been shown to reduce the amount of stress that is experienced by healthcare workers. Now, self-directed learning, which I think is closely related to self-reflection, uh, um, is really what we want to try and get at. Here's a really interesting study um, that I found where learners who were physicians were compared to learners who were physicians and medical educators. 
and I'm sorry, who are physicians and musicians at the same time. So these are called doctor musicians and their practice was compared to music students who were not physicians. And some of the interesting work that came out from understanding how they understood our, um, understood their performance and ability. So here's a doctor musician uh, uh, talking about their performance. They said, it's really important to know when you're not equipped to do something, like that you're not competent to do something and be able to ask for help or refer it on or whatever. Where a musician said, your voice sounds completely different in your head than it sounds to everyone else. And I think what that means to me is that one, the importance of self-reflection helps you understand where your level of performance or your level of expertise ends and you need to help get help from someone else. And the other piece to it is when your voice sounds different in your own head than it sounds to everyone else, perhaps it's important to have reflective practice, not only to hear your own voice, but perhaps to invite others into that reflective practice to understand what it sounds like to them. So for example, as I was preparing to record this workshop, I made sure to practice it in front of somebody else so I could get feedback on what it might sound like to them. So as a result, we developed a little self-reflection exercise that I now do with most of my learners. In the beginning of our rotation together, I have them use this wheel to think about where they currently stand in terms of all of these domains in the context of where they exist. So for example, if I'm on a ward service, I will ask my learners to think about um, how approachable they are, their communication skills, their practical skills, their motivational skills, organizational skills, etc. And if they imagine the outside of this circle to be, let's say, a 10, and the center of the circle to be, let's say, a zero, which of those spokes in the wheel would they mark themselves at for each of those domains, for currently where they may be? And then I ask them to think about, based on that, what do I do well? What can I do better? How can I continue to improve my performance in this course? What do I need to do to make this happen? In other words, what do I need to do to improve myself? And then how will I know that I have improved? What I usually find with my learners is that they can identify what they do well. They can identify where their gaps may be. But the last three questions become a little bit more difficult for them. And what I usually find is they give me very general, very broad responses for those. And it's my role as their educator to help coach them into coming up with very definitive, very quantifiable statements. So as an example, while I'm on service, I may, be, uh, I may realize that I'm really good at getting a history, but I'm not so good at getting my neurological exam um, and performing it in the way that allows me to get the responses I'm looking for. So what might I be able, what do I need to do to continue to improve my performance? Well, I probably need to do more neuro exams on people. How, what do I need to do to make this happen? I need to make sure that I, um, on every patient that I admit, I do a full neuro examination. How will I know I have improved? Well, I'm probably going to ask somebody to watch me, give me a rubric of what to expect on a neurological exam. Let me practice a few times. And then when I feel comfortable, I'm going to have them come and watch me with the rubric and check it off to tell me that I performed all of the things that I needed to for that neurological exam. So that's specific, it's doable, it's observable, and it's quantifiable. So what I'd like for you to do now is pull out that sheet that I've, um, is included in your folder. And I want you to do this self-assessment wheel exercise on yourself. And I want you to think about what are the things that you feel you are lacking in at the moment that you need in order to be an excellent intern July 1? And also think about what you're hoping to get out of this two-week EPA course that might help you in those things. I'm going to ask you to take a few minutes to really fill this out. Keep it with you. If we were doing this live, I would have spent a little bit of time um, going through your responses. Um, and what I'm hoping to do is at the end of this two weeks, I'm going to ask you to redo this exercise and think about in this two week EPA course, whether you achieved some of the things that you felt you needed 
And then at that time, redo the exercise to think about what do you need next in order to best be prepared for July 1. In this unique circumstance, this year, March 2020, we may be facing some incredible uncertainties and hardships, and you may be called upon to perform your duties much sooner than we had all anticipated. So I encourage you to take this time to reflect on who you are, who you want to be, and how best you can serve both yourself, your educators, and the community at large. Please feel free to email me with any questions or concerns, and I wish you the best of luck. And before I sign off, just some Sentiments of encouragement from that same paper of the doctor musicians and the musicians. In medicine, I was most concerned about competency, so I really wanted to be able to do everything right. But in music, it's sort of more than competency. You want to be good. And the musician says, if you're hired at an opera company, you're not going to be learning the score by yourself and just performing it. You're going to be working with coaches, directors, you're always in that process of learning from other people and having that community of a team to help you to that performance. That will never go away. So know that you will always be working as part of a team and part of your work in that team is to be able to reflect on your own performance. Good luck.